So when I first saw the topic, I was tempted to sort of reword it or rephrase it as national security challenges of, of maritime India. It's because I now see telltale signs of increasing maritime consciousness in our country, be it some of the key articulations by our Honorable Prime Minister, such as Sagar, Security and Growth for All in the Region, or IPOI, the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, be it the conduct of the open debate on maritime security at the UN by India as the chair of the UNSC in August 2021, or be it the National Security Advisor Sri Ajit Doval's assertion that maritime security has gained its rightful prominence in India's security discourse as well as international outreach. Be it initiatives such as impetus to the blue economy, promulgation of a maritime vision 2030, or the recent hike in the Navy's share of the defense budget to 18.26%, the highest in the last two decades. All this, to my mind, points to a, a mindset of harnessing the seas for strategic, diplomatic, military, and economic gains towards our national prosperity and growth. So to, uh, I feel that the maritime character of our nation is now uh, shaping our overall outlook and probably is gaining the recognition that it uh, deserves. So suffice to say, the interplay between maritime security and India's prosperity is becoming probably more clearer to the polity, the policy makers and the people of India. Thus, uh, maritime India is on the rise and the tides of time demand that we grab this opportunity to sail out in these high waters. I would quote Shakespeare in uh, Julius Caesar where Brutus uh, talked to Cassius thus. He says, there is a tide in the affairs of men which when taken at the flood leads to fortune. Omitted, all the voyage of the life is bound in shallows and in miseries. On such a full sea are we now afloat and we must take the current when it, uh, when it serves or lose our ventures." Unquote. So this is probably the time when we need to grab the opportunity to harness the blue economy, what the oceans have to offer, and, uh, and use it to our advantage uh, for the prosperity of our nation. So maritime India, however, is not a function of the Navy alone. But rather, it's a national effort. It's a collective effort. It spans the government, policymakers, the national security agencies, uh, maritime security agencies, seafarers, shipping, shipbuilding, uh, industry, the fishing community, energy uh, agents, energy uh, industry, the traders, offshore industry, exporters, importers, and indeed every citizen of our country. So in a journey into the future, there will be challenges as well as concurrent opportunities. And in my talk today, I will highlight the security challenges that we face in the maritime domain as well as the Indian Navy's lines of effort in tackling these challenges to harness the associated opportunities. So before elaborating on the challenges, let me first briefly dwell upon the maritime domain itself. It is far different from the terra firma that we live on because unlike land, nobody lives on the ocean. The oceans are largely uncontrolled, unowned, and unregulated global commons. Uncontrolled because 70 percent is covered of the earth is covered by oceans, and 85 percent of the world's nations have access to the seas. And yet, the inherent fluidity of the seas means that one cannot seize or hold it or occupy these vast waters. Essentially, they remain free, therefore. And the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, 1982, provides clarity on jurisdictions and permissible activities upon the seas. However, the traditional and enduring principle of freedom of the seas limits absolute control by any one entity. So these uncontrolled seas are also largely unowned. Only about 5% of the seas being territorial seas are governed by the laws of the land, 
while the remaining 95% are free for navigation and overflight. So in terms of owning the resources, nearly 90% of the seas by volume and 64% by uh, surface area are beyond the exclusive economic zones and therefore beyond any state's jurisdiction. So this results in a cognitive dissonance towards comprehending the difference between the concept of sovereignty and right of a state on land vis-a-vis -vis at sea. Uh, on land, we understand very clearly what is sovereignty. That is, you know, there are borders, everything within that belongs to us. We have sovereign rights and so on, the airspace above it, and etc. But when it comes to the sea, there is a, uh, a subtle difference because there is freedom of navigation, right of innocent passage, all this are associated in our EZ and even in our territorial waters. So therefore, understanding this, uh, uh, this concept of sovereignty as it applies to the seas is something that uh, requires a little bit of uh, you know, thought. So this lack of legal ownership translates into the seas remaining largely unregulated as well. Their vastness associated by the tyranny of distance because it takes a certain amount of time to go from one, one, uh, one port to another. It implies that the seas cannot be organized or governed to any significant distance from the land. Uh, just to uh, highlight the complexity of the problem, I just want to say that a ship which is built in one country, owned by a person from another country, hired by a third country, using the flag of convenience of another entirely different country, is crewed by multinational uh, national personnel, operated by some other uh, nation, carrying cargo for a multitude of personnel, of, uh, uh, of uh, receivers, and transshipped through diverse parts in different countries. So you find that uh, it is quite a, quite a maze when it comes to the issues related to ships and uh, shipping and the maritime domain. These distinct characteristics in turn contribute to the oceans being a global commons, free for all to access, navigate and utilize in pursuit of respective interests. So being the global commons, the oceans also provide unfettered reach and access to the nation states and therefore they are a medium of choice for power projection. And this brings with it an element of competition in the maritime domain. However, since individual state uh, capacities significantly dwarf the capacity that is required uh, because of the immense potential of the seas in terms of natural resources, trade, connectivity, etc., there is a tendency for nations to cooperate, to come together. And also, uh, many of these challenges are transnational. It is not limited to just any one uh, nation. For example, if you look at piracy, armed robbery, drug smuggling, as well as national disaster, uh, natural disasters, climate change, they all are multinational activities and they foster convergence between nations, navies and maritime security agencies. Thus, there is also an inherent element of cooperation that the oceans offer. So, as a consequence of these elements of competition and cooperation, the states consider it prudent to ensure that uh, there is free and full use of the seas as it allows furthering of their own economic and strategic interests. That the maritime domain, with its nature of being uncontrolled, unowned, unregulated global commons, is unique in many ways. So, with this as a background, let me now dwell upon India's maritime security challenges. I view the contemporary and future maritime security challenges through an interconnected trinity of eyes, three eyes I would say, imperatives at home, influences from outside and intrusive paradigms, which have an impact across all spheres of cooperation, competition as well as our day-to-day -day lives. So beginning with the imperatives at home, the primary imperative for the Indian Navy is to protect our national interests in the maritime domain against inimical action by adversarial actors across the entire spectrum of conflict, as well as below the threshold of conflict. 
concomitantly and equally importantly there is a need to ensure safe and secure seas to catalyze economic growth and prosperity so in order to meet these imperatives there are numerous challenges but i will dwell only upon three notable aspects namely the military the economic and organizational firstly the military challenges india's security drivers have evolved in complexity over recent years the international order is undoubtedly undergoing a rapid transformation multilateralism is on the decline global institutions are losing their effectiveness great power competition is unfolding and as an accompanying effect the global commons are increasingly become becoming contested domains be it the oceans be it space be it cyber and in this contestation credible military power remains a crucial lever for protecting our national interests and expanding our strategic footprint so in this the indian navy plays an important role given the predominantly maritime character of our region which is the indo pacific so we closely monitor trends and patterns of threats and challenges from traditional as well as non traditional sources capable of impacting the maritime domain so traditionally india continues to face challenges posed by state actors across multiple spheres including in the maritime domain so while competition at sea is played out almost on a daily basis at times testing limits but without escalating into armed action a war with potential adversaries can never be ruled out hence the vital need to remain poised and prepared for such an eventuality while working hard to deter such a possibility on the other hand in the recent years non traditional security threats such as maritime terrorism piracy uh, armed robbery illegal unreported unregulated fishing human and arms and drug trafficking etc have added a fresh paradigm to the security uh, scenario so maritime terrorism has expanded in recent years and is manifesting in new ways and means piracy and armed robbery at sea also remain a significant threat to international shipping and seafarers right now we see it quite subdued because of the effect of a large number of multinational maritime forces being present in the area the constant challenge of unregulated activities and inherent limitation in the maritime domain awareness poses a significant challenge as they could enable other threats there have also been more instances of natural disasters and regional instabilities over the past decade necessitating increased deployment for the indian navy towards hid hdr operations and non combatant evacuation uh, operations so all of these challenges both traditional and non traditional remain interrelated uh, related and together form a web of threats coexisting and sometimes supporting each other so navigating through these challenges is a primary concern right now and will remain so for the foreseeable future which brings me to the economic imperatives and challenges therein since uh, 2015 india has moved from the 10th to the 5th place in terms of the size of our economy and we are at knocking at the doors of germany to be the fourth largest economy in the world maybe by uh, the next year end india's gdp is 3.5 trillion dollars today and by some estimates it could surpass 26 trillion dollar mark by 2047 a nearly eight fold increase so concurrently our exports are also growing so in 2021 22 india's merchandise export was a record 422 billion dollars and in the current financial year it had crossed 332 billion dollars in till uh, last december and there is an expected growth about of about 17.83% it is clear therefore that an export based economy will be a prime mover for achieving the goal of becoming a fully developed nation by 2047 here i would like to draw your attention to two books a splendid exchange by william bernstein and to rule the waves by bruce d jones both these must reads highlight the importance of trade or port led development in global commerce quoting examples from prehistoric era highlighting india's share of the gdp up to the 16th century 
as well as articulating the maritime trade based growth of Europe, UK, US and China. And now probably it is our turn. It also elaborates the myriad crisis confronting the global commerce today. Therefore, the aspects of commerce or port-led development and blue economy have and will continue to play a pivotal role in enhancing our national growth potential. And vast volumes of our exports inevitably will be facilitated by the seas. With 95% of India's trade by volume and 68% by value being seaborne, the free access to ports and secure sea lanes remain crucial to our economic well-being. The seas, in comparison to road and rail, continue to be the most economic means of transportation and will continue to remain so unless we come across some new technology like quantum transportation. So it provides an efficiency ratio, I would say, of road to rail to sea as 1 is to 10 is to 100. That is for the same amount of energy we can transport about 250 kgs by road, 2500 kgs by rail and 25,000 kgs by sea. So that is the scale of efficiency that you achieve when you move by sea. And catalyzed by the seas, India's expanding economy mandates security of our inter interests across a significantly wider geography, most of which is accessible largely by the oceans. To quote Admiral Alfred Thayer Mahan on the subject, he said that the necessity of a navy in the restricted sense of the word springs therefore from the existence of peaceful shipping and disappears with it, except in the case of a nation which has aggressive tendencies and keeps up a navy merely as a branch of the military establishment. This was the, uh, it's a quote which I took out from the influence of sea power upon history written by him. So another related aspect which starkly underscores the ongoing conflict in Europe is our continued dependence on external sources. And the last few months have been a clear reaffirmation of the inescapable need for Atmanirbhartha to be pursued in letter and spirit. So we as a nation envision to be the manufacturing centre of the world and in that endeavour our ports will be the hub of all maritime activity. However, this in one, this one aspect in which we are lagging behind quite drastically. We do not have even one port in the first 25 busiest ports of the world. Whereas China has five in the first ten. So this is something which we need to work upon and uh, we need to develop our ports and develop the, the connectivity and the infrastructure. So I will be covering this aspect of Admanarbhada a little later. Effectively addressing these economic imperatives will require organization strength, efficiency and synergy. So this brings me to the third imperative at home which is organization. So having recognized the need to reimagine the conduct of business of war, the armed forces have set themselves on the path of reorganizing and reorienting for the future. Establishment of the DMA, appointment of the CDS, the Agnipath, theatrization, integration, etc. They are all steps in the correct direction. However, notwithstanding continued evolution of the services and the overall national security architecture, I must say that silos still exist. The imperative is to overcome turf protection tendencies as well as organizational inertia to change. And in doing this, it is important for the Navy and the services to get our act right as we transit to new organizational structures. Time is at a premium and we will need to move fast. So just like for any policy, it is not just the intention but also thoroughness and efficient implementation that counts, getting the organizational changes right, will be the vital uh, aspect to reap the desired benefits of joinness and integration. So having spoken about home, let me also speak about a way or the next I, which is influences from outside, by which I allude to the external issues impacting our interests. Primary among these is the increased centrality of the Indo-Pacific in the global geostrategic calculus. A large number of countries have 
come out with a Indo-Pacific strategy and many of them do not belong to the region as well. Indo-Pacific as a geostrategic reality is also accompanied by a return of great power competition. The US-China rivalry is here to stay and it is not a short sprint but I feel a long marathon that they are engaged in. This has led inevitably to a naval arms race between the West and China, quite similar perhaps to the pre-World War I era between the Allied and the Central Powers. For instance, China has inducted 148 warships over the last 10 years, which is, I would say, is perhaps nearly the entire Indian Navy's size, and the process still continues. So this arms race has made our resource-rich region an arena for jostling for influence, markets, resources, and energy, among others. So notwithstanding this jostling, the intricately interwoven and uh, interdependent metrics of economic relations also mandates a certain level of cooperation among these very states. This simultaneous competition and cooperation accentuates the complexities of security. While much has been said of the ongoing conflict in Europe, the fact that despite extensive sanctions by the West on Russia, most of Europe continues to receive Russian energy underscores that even during conflicts, it is unlikely that states can be completely devoid of mutual dependencies. Climate change too is affecting our strategic calculus, be it melting of the Arctic or rising sea levels, threatening livelihoods of islands and littorals. Climate change challenges will impact the global interactions in the days ahead. It may in fact emerge as a major security challenge in our calculus. Amidst these influences from outside, driven by the churn in the Indo-Pacific and Europe, it will be a challenge to identify our own strategic space, create opportunities for engagement and partnerships, and balance relationships in the emerging complicated metrics of competitors, friends, and partners. However, military power alone will be grossly insufficient as this competition will transcend multiple domains encompassing not just the physical but also the digital and cognitive domains. And that brings me to the third I which is intrusive paradigms. We are witnessing the rise of certain all-encompassing, all-pervasive, all-impacting or in one word intrusive paradigms and these impose a unique set of challenges. The first paradigm is the one encompassing rapid technological advancements across various fields such as AI, machine learning, hypersonics, genetics, quantum communications, laser and so on. And these create new capabilities with the prospect of delivering effects dispro disproportionate to their costs. So these offer a wide array of options in both military and civil domains. So developments like the chat GPT are only an indicator of the immense potential that technological advancements bear. And these also provide nations with a broader spectrum of dissuasive, deterrent and coercive tools below the level of visible kinetic action. Such options are emerging as a preferred choice for states to achieve strategic effects. Equally, such capabilities are also available to non-state actors terror organizations, drugs and arms running syndicates and the like with a multitude of new and maybe yet unknown options. An intersecting paradigm is the changing techscape that is cyber. It has permeated all spheres of our lives ranging from meeting our daily requirements to governance and war fighting. Cyber is everywhere. It provides inimical actors, freedom of action, non-attributability and near-perfect invisibility in cyberspace. Balancing cyber dependencies with inherent security challenges will continue to retain primacy in our calculus as well. So intrinsically linked with all our activities is the cognitive domain and while gaining ascendancy in this domain has always been important, what has changed is the velocity of reach through social and digital media which makes it even more critical. Today, it works at the speed of light, unlike yesteryears. So in our context, 
the adversaries can exploit our open and social and uh, liberal society to attack and uh, attack the core of a nation by challenging our constitutional values so our challenge is therefore to declutter the noise across the strata of national and military leadership and equally importantly for the common man thus the three eyes that is uh, imperatives at home influences from outside and intrusive paradigms and their different manifest manifestations define our primary security challenges in the maritime domain so while these challenges have and will always exist the indian navy stands ready to safe safeguard and promote india's security and national interests and towards this the navy's efforts are aimed at adding value to the holistic national security uh, apparatus both figuratively and literally and this is how we act as the principal principal manifestation of india's maritime power so the word value as an acronym sim quite simply breaks down as v for vision a for assurance l for leveraging atmanirbharta u as a uniting force and e as an engagement i will cover each of these uh, subsequently the v in value alludes to the vision for the oceans if the indian navy is to secure india's national interests safe and secure seas become imperative so given the expanse of the indian ocean region which is 20 times the land mass of india and this just the ior not the indo pacific we recognize that no one can do it alone therefore there is a need to collaborate with like minded partners so in this endeavor the navy is guided by the nation's intrinsically intrinsically inclusive vision called saga meaning oceans and expanse as security and growth for all in the region it envisages that all of us in the region will grow prosper and develop together in a secure environment framed by mutual convergences the values underpinning underpinning this vision encompass what we call the five ss that is saman samvad shanti samriddhi and notably sahyog or cooperation so guided by this the indian navy's vision is to remain a combat ready credible cohesive and future proof force in service of the nation by combat ready the focus is on ordnance centricity the role worthiness of assets training the personnel the morale as concurrent enablers realistic exercises high tempo of operations and a balanced multi dimensional network network force that can operate effectively across the entire spectrum and coming to credibility this is pursued through ensuring enhanced reach sustenance footprint and familiarization of our areas of interest forward posture and prompt and assured response to any situation so our sustained mission based deployments across the vast oceans enable us to tackle any contingency be it domestic or international with alacrity and reliability this is also complementary to our endeavor of being the first responder and preferred security partner for our friends and partners in the region and in terms and on offer i can proudly say that the navy encourages nari shakti through advocating and practicing women empowerment moreover women are also uh, already undertaking diverse roles and shouldering responsibilities including combat roles so as i speak there are 33 women officers who are posted on board our frontline warships and 273 women agnivirs undergoing training at ins chilka for the first time externally our efforts are aimed at establishing and enhancing trust with stakeholders across the domestic and international canvas and domestically we are closely enmeshed with the multitude of agencies involved in the maritime domain this straddles a vast canvas across numerous sectors such as security technology shipping ports trade ship building fisheries industry to name just a few internationally we engage regularly with friends and partners to develop interoperability and trust and towards this uh, joint surveillance of the exclusive economic zones as well as coordinated patrols with friendly foreign countries have helped us secure the region 
against a range of maritime security threats. As far as being future proof is concerned, the focus is on the long view, by which I mean transformational changes which will instill agility and strengthen our organizations to withstand the shocks of today as well as those of tomorrow. Towards this end, we seek to innovate and evolve mechanisms that foster development and incorporation of niche technologies at a rapid pace. Our approach is to adopt an exponential thinking rather than the traditional linear one and therefore pole vault instead of leapfrog the technology curve. Accordingly, the IN has established the Naval Innovation and Indigenization Organization which looks at emerging technological trends for implementation in the Navy. Another significant step towards being future-proof is the recently introduced Agnipath scheme and today our society and our nation are poised at the cusp of becoming the world's largest population and more importantly being endowed with a youthful demography in the coming decades. There is an abundant opportunity through Agnipath to tap into the abundant pool of vibrant and exuberant youth to make our forces younger, nimbler, more tech savvy and more effective. So while this is a transformational initiative for the armed forces, it will also play a vital role in the growth, prosperity and transformation of a nation. As a steady stream of trained, disciplined and motivated young Agnivirs having completed their service, joined the national workforce, the benefits to society and country will become evident through their contribution to nation building. In pursuance of our vision, the Indian Navy understands its responsibility to provide assurance and build trust with the friendly nations. This assurance is the A in the word value. So assurance and trust are the central pillars on which our engagements with friends and partners stand firmly. And one prime example of India's endeavours in this regard are the mission-based deployments which I mentioned earlier. It has accrued three advantages. We remain poised for rapid operations in, in, in a contingency. It increases our familiarity with our area of operations. And third, it assures friendly nations that we are ready to assist when called upon thereby building our credibility as a maritime power. So while we deploy to distant locations, we also continue to be proactive in rendering humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Uh, look at our COVID response, for instance. You must have witnessed India's extensive outreach to the regions in terms of vaccines, medicines, protective equipment, trained personnel, so on, even during our times of need. Equally, our friends in the region too reciprocated by sharing their resources such as liquid oxygen, oxygen cylinders, etc. when we needed them the most. And I would say that these are enduring examples of assurance and trust. This assurance and trust has been further strengthened by the fact that we are fast becoming Atmanirbhar or self-reliant to a large extent in our defence capabilities, especially with regard to shipbuilding. So while this has a positive impact on military preparedness of the Indian Armed Forces, it also has positive connotations for the region as a whole. And this is how leveraging Atmanur Bharata, the L in value, or latest evolution of Atmanur Bharata has been the maiden operation of the LCA Navy on board INS Vikrant. Though we could call it as just another landing, and take off, we have to understand its significance. The landing of an indigenous aircraft by an Indian pilot trained in India on an indigenous aircraft carrier designed in India in Indian waters is a real testimony to our nation's progress towards Atmanur Bharata. Very few countries in the world are capable of achieving this. And not just that, the entire content in construction of Vikrant is close to 76% indigenous content, which includes the ship's indigenous steel DMR-249, which has been made in India in collaboration with DRDO, with Midani and SAIL, along with the Indian Navy. The indigenous construction of the carrier also generated employment opportunities and bolstered the plowback effect on the domestic economy. 
close to 2000 shipyard workers and 13000 non yard personnel that is personnel working in the msmes and other ancillary industries were were employed on a yearly basis towards construction of vikran thus providing the estimated shipbuilding employment multiplier effect of 6.4 so vikran is a shining ex example of aspirational and atmanirbhar bharat and I will, and will proudly fly our tiranga across the far reaches of the world for decades to come it will be an icon of national pride national strength national resolve and national inspiration so in terms of strengthening our indigenous industry uh, the indian navy has been a major contributor to the rise of the indian shipbuilding industry this is underpinned by the navy's single minded focus on transforming itself from a buyers navy in 1947 to a builders navy it is said that you cannot buy a navy you have to build it so today there are 41 out of 43 ships under uh, ships and submarines ordered by the navy under construction in indian shipyards and apart from indian naval ships warships from friendly foreign countries have begun utilizing indian shipyards and naval dockyards for repair and refit of their platforms which has enhanced the prospect of a export driven indian shipbuilding industry for instance one of the us navy's dry cargo ship usns charles drew undertook repairs at the katupally shipyard last year and uh, today the usns matthew perry entered lnt shipyard katupally again for voyage, voyage repairs from 11th to 29th march of this month so uh, we see the growing use of our shipyards by you know friendly uh, foreign countries for repairs refits and so on fiscally the indian navy has always endeavored to reinvest a large share of its budget back into the indian economy some of you may have already read the recently released economic survey 2022-23 which highlights and acknowledges the navy's contribution to this aspect it states that every rupee spent on shipbuilding triggers circulation of 1.82 rupees therefore the navy's current order book worth 1.5 lakh crores will result in circulation of nearly 2.73 lakh crores in the shipbuilding sector as a whole so our endeavors towards atmanirbharta are not just limited to shipbuilding indian navy's efforts have yielded fruitful outcomes towards development of niche systems such as electronic warfare suits sonars weapons sensors uh, machinery systems with nearly 3000 systems and subsystems being indigenized there are many other success stories pertaining to atmanirbharta and defense which highlight the Im immense potential of the indian defense sector for instance brahmos the supersonic cruise missile which is now being exported and the fighter aircraft tejas for which an increasing number of countries are interested point to a prospective profitability of indigenous defense production ventures and the nation has set itself a clear goal that of becoming a developed nation by 2047 and as a corollary the navy at 2047 must be the reflection of a confident nation a strong nation an aspirational nation and therefore the navy will be a fully atmanirbhar force by the 100th anniversary of india's independence and this is a commitment we in the navy have made to our national leadership and we are confident that we'll get there an atmanirbhar indian navy also plays the role of a uniting force in the region the u in value we recognize our responsibility to be the pillar around which a combined force for good could be built we work alongside like minded nations harnessing the issue based convergences and towards this at the strategic level we are actively pursuing initiatives under the ambit of the of the uh, mea such as the active actis policy asean admm plus iora ioc ipoi and the djibouti code of conduct these initiatives provide the necessary framework for meaningful and constructive dialogue and also form the basis for enhancing the navy's engagements with like minded maritime nations at the operation level 
initiatives such as standing arrangements for faster operational turnaround of assets, logistic agreements for better interoperability and operation of surface assets and air assets from each other's bases and access facilities. All this help to improve interoperability, enhance security and reaffirm our commitment to be the first port of call for our friendly maritime nations in the Indo-Pacific. In addition, forging collaborative frameworks such as IONS, the Goa Maritime Conclave and Milan form an important element of our commitment to the region. The Indian Ocean Naval Symposium or IONS is one such framework which is only 14 years old, yet it has achieved significant strides in pro promoting collaborative engagements in the IOR. Similarly, the Goa Maritime Conclave or GMC in short promotes a constructive and outcome oriented dialogue among our neighborhood navies. Another such initiative is Milan, a biennial multilateral exercise initiated by the Navy in 1995, which has grown in stature over the years. The last edition in, uh, uh, in February 2022 witnessed the largest ever participation with more than 40 navies coming together to enhance maritime cooperation and build interoperability at sea. So while the Navy is pursuing these multiple lines of effort externally, I am also quite clear that our efforts to be a uniting force will need to remain focused internally as well. The vision of combat readiness, credibility, cohesiveness and future proofing cannot be achieved by the Navy alone. A significant driver in this pursuit will be the synergy and jointness amongst the three services. Joint efforts leading to joint outcomes and driven by a common purpose will be instrumental in preparing us for tomorrow's battlefield. The Navy remains a proponent of fostering tri-service synergy across various peers, be it operations, leveraging and optimizing each other's resources, integration of operational networks, inventory management, joint acquisitions, capacity enhancements, etc., which will all augur well for our collective future. So through these initiatives, the Indian Navy acts as a uniting force for bringing friends together to exchange views and address common concerns for a holistic maritime security. So it very simply means partners coming together, having an equal seat at the table and pooling resources to leverage what each can bring to bear. And it is through these endeavors that confidence in each other is built surely but steadily. The four pillars that I spoke of so far, that vision, assurance, leveraging Atmanirpata and uniting force manifest as engaging as enhanced engagements with friendly maritime security forces, the last pillar of Indian Navy's value to the Indo-Pacific engagements. Our engagements in the region straddle multiple lines of efforts focused on a broad trinity of remaining the preferred security partner and, fr and first responder while concurrently enabling collective maritime competence. So towards being a preferred security partner, our engagements are based on a shared goal of enhancing the region's maritime security quotient. And in this endeavor, the Navy's persistent presence and preparedness across our areas of interest is a critical enabler in addressing shared security challenges. And as regards being the first responder, we have remained at the forefront in providing assistance over a wide spectrum of situations, including those related to natural disasters, medical emergencies, critical technical situations, and incident responses amongst numerous others. Our swift and timely response is enabled by the flexibility, mobility, and reach inherent to naval forces in general and the Indian Navy in particular, given our force structures and deployments. And coming to collective maritime competence, we understand that each Navy or nation in the Indo-Pacific brings certain unique capacities and capabilities to the table. Expertise, intelligence, technology, uh, geographical locations and assets. So we harness these to tackle common challenges together by creating a participative, inclusive ecosystem rather than a prohibitive and elitist one. So while the Navy is pursuing multiple lines of effort, I am also quite clear that holistic maritime security cannot be achieved by our Navy alone. So navigating the turbulent and unpredictable tides of the present, 
and the ambiguities of the future can no longer be a single service or indeed even a joint service endeavor. The Honorable Prime Minister also alluded to the effort during his address at the Swavalamban Seminar in, uh, on, uh, uh, in July last year. And I quote him, the collective national consciousness of various people of India is the strong basis of security and prosperity, unquote. The present demands thus a whole of government approach and the focused national efforts today in this regard are quite evident. And going beyond this, the future will also impose an in inescapable need for a whole of society approach towards which I think we are moving gradually. Collectively, we would need to remain persistent and patient in our efforts while ensuring regular presence in our areas of interest. I have every confidence that while we retain the ability to counter every challenge today, our abilities to address the challenges of the future will be even greater together. So with that, I conclude my talk and I look forward to the discussions. Thank you. Jai Hind. Thank you, Admiral Hari Kumar, for that uh, very comprehensive uh, area. I think a lot of work is uh, being done. Now, of course, at the same time, the uh, security environment is also very complex, and the challenges are also huge. But I think uh, the way to deal with the challenges is to have a Atmanirbharta and also a deep engagement. I think uh, this would uh, uh, very well. Uh, sum up the way the Navy is functioning. So I think I'll open this now for some sure. uh, uh, questions and answers and some uh, brief comments uh, from the floor. So kindly keep your uh, uh, interventions brief and the floor is now open. Yes. Please introduce yourself. Uh, good evening, sir. I'm Pooja Bhatt and I'm a maritime researcher. Uh, sir, kindly allow me to indulge you in the unclosed thing that you were speaking about earlier. Uh, I wanted to ask about how Indian Navy has been thinking about utilizing UNCLOS in terms of protection of our own territorial waters. Because UNCLOS is a wide document which provides, you know, uh, uh, any number of you know, threat issues. Whether they talk about are you fishing, you autonomous vehicles, any, you know, current and future threat challenges that we are facing, UNCLOS has answer for that. How in the Indian Navy are we thinking about utilizing international maritime law uh, for the security of our EZ and also collaborating with other countries because it has also some provisions for collaborating with other countries in, under UN clause. First is us and second is a little more controversial. What will it take uh, to make Djibouti a port for India? Like are we thinking about it and if we are, what will it take for us in Indian Navy to make a port in Djibouti? Two questions, thank you. UNCLOS forms the basis of uh, our uh, interactions at sea and uh, we are maritime zones of India which is you know act also uh, was almost a fallout of that. So uh, it clearly demarcates you know the the uh, the baseline the territorial sea the uh, easy and uh, you know the uh, uh, seabed limits and so on. So uh, it that you know the UNCLOS basically uh, helps you. It it provides the the basis for uh, your uh, engagements at sea. I would say it is uh, uh, if you are looking at a free, open, and uh, rules based, inclusive uh, uh, functioning at sea. Then the UNCLOS is the uh, is the international uh, law, I would say. Uh, it's been agreed to by almost all the uh, nations. And therefore, uh, we, we, uh, our functioning is uh, uh, underpinned by, uh, by UNCLOS. So, uh, uh, it therefore provides us opportunities to engage with our uh, uh, friendly foreign countries in the region. Uh, we, uh, we abide by it. And uh, therefore, we feel that all, all nations have to uh, uh, avail the benefits by, uh, by abiding by it so that you are able to uh, harness what the global commons has to offer. Because it belongs to uh, everybody, it, uh, it, is, it is free, 
you can use it for your own trade and your growth because uh, you know, uh, very little trade can happen over land. Uh, as I had alluded to, the uh, the bulk of the uh, uh, of the cargo, the bulk of exports, bulk of imports, everything has to actually go by sea. Very little can move over land. And in our case, if you see. Uh, to the north we have the Himalayas and to the west we have Pakistan. So, and over land it is almost impossible to, you know, uh, to conduct trade. So, therefore, all this trade has to flow through the sea. So, that is why the sea is very important and for us, uh, you know, uh, the international law which has evolved over centuries uh, forms the basis on which we, uh, the navies function at sea and uh, therefore we, uh, we believe in uh, in uh, ensuring a free, open, and uh, inclusive uh, Indo-Pacific based upon a rules-based order. So that is what we are pursuing. Uh, uh, your question about you know Djibouti? Yes, Djibouti is a place where we we operate from. Our ships go there. In fact, we operate not just from Djibouti. We operate from various various ports. Our ships put in our aircraft uh, visit various ports and operate from there. So it is based upon our our interests, you know, as to where, uh, how do we uh, take forward or forward uh, our uh, our uh, interest in the maritime domain. So uh, the primary job of the navy is to protect, preserve, and promote the national interests of uh, our country in the maritime domain. And uh, so when we look at it. Uh, wherever need to we need to uh, uh, to operate where we need to uh, have uh, facilities for uh, entering a port and refueling etc uh, we uh, undertake operational turnaround with with uh, uh, in uh, nearly 35 ports in the region so our uh, ships regularly put in uh, to uh, uh, to muscat salala to djibouti uh, Mombasa, uh, you know, Mauritius, Seychelles, uh, Reunion, uh, similarly the ports on the uh, east coast as well, uh, on the eastern side of the IOR as well. So, uh, so it is uh, it is quite uh, uh, essential for us uh, to have this ability to to uh, have operational turnaround at various you know ports. It's not just Djibouti alone. Yeah. Okay. Yes, please. Good evening, sir. My name is Ankit. Uh, sir, it, I couldn't help but notice that in the V for Vision, the word theatrization uh, was absent. I, I know that you stressed the synergy between the three armed services, but what are your views on the need for integrated commands? Do you think that perhaps the Indian Navy doesn't need to be uh, it, perhaps it's a synergy between the Indian uh, Army and the Air Force is more important and the Navy could retain some of its autonomy because the challenges that face uh, us, uh, China, for example, China and Pakistan, maybe does not involve the Navy. Uh. The, uh, uh, we are all for the Navy has uh, all, always been a, uh, a proponent of jointness. So, if you see the uh, Andaman Nicobar Command, uh, it, earlier it used to be a uh, fortress commander Andaman Nicobar and then it got transformed into a joint command. So, there the Navy is the largest participant in that and uh, you know, uh, so Navy has always been in the forefront of joinness. Uh, I have had the good fortune of uh, being the CISC or the first VCDS when the uh, first the CDS was created, uh, General, when General Rawat was appointed, I served with him for about uh, 15 months. Uh, we had, uh, you know, worked on uh, various, various issues of, uh, of joinness, uh, theatrization, optimization and so on. A lot of uh, ground had been covered in those respects. Uh, now with the new CDS, uh, this, uh, those issues are being looked at again. Uh, I'm not in a position to comment upon, uh, you know, the exact details of the uh, theatrization, but uh, let me assure you that uh, adequate work is happening. And uh, the aim of, uh, what is the aim of theatrization? The aim of theatrization is to ensure that we get the effect that we want 
uh, with the, uh, with the uh, by using our assets in an optimal manner and the times have gone when uh, you know uh, even since the second world war uh, general eisenhower used to say that the times have gone uh, since the time uh, since a, a conflict or a battle could be identified purely as a land battle or a air battle or a sea battle uh, if you uh, if you look into it very closely you will find that there are always elements of it in some to some degree or the other so uh, it is important that uh, with the resources that we have we should be able to deliver the effects that we want and that each service brings a, a strength that it has uh, to the table so when we uh, when we uh, bring the uh, three services together we just don't add but we multiply the effects so that is why theaterization is important uh, uh, theaterization has three aspects okay uh, it is uh, unity of effort unity of command and unification so these three uh, because uh, i am quite convinced that in a in when a uh, when a battle requires the last ounce of of uh, capability or firepower that is required the commander cannot be left in a uh, position where he has to plead or negotiate or you know request or keep asking for some message he should have whatever he needs to win the battle at the, you know that last ounce of uh, uh, capability that he requires must be uh, with him under his command so that is that is the principle that's why it is important to have uh, these three aspects of it that is uh, unity of effort unity of command and unification okay Yes, please. I don't have a question. I'm just supplementing, sir, what you have said. The historic win of 1971 is a testimony that Navy did a great deal in that, contributed a great deal in that. My friend is not of that age or vintage to perhaps appreciate it. But yes, the people who were involved are my neighbors today and I know what it meant and what it you know, created. Uh, in terms of our firepower in uh, the great grand victory. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. I saw some hand here. Yeah. Uh, sir, thank you for the very insightful talk. I am Shantan. I am a PhD student at the Department of Fire at South Asian University. Sir, uh, looking forward in the context of the evolving uh, geopolitical context, particularly in the Indian Ocean region and specifically in the domain of maritime security, what in your view should be the three, should be the top three key focus areas for India in the coming days? Thank you. We should, uh, uh, we should focus on, uh, you know, ensuring that we have a good uh, engagement with all the countries in our region, uh, which is what the Navy is making its, its own contribution towards engaging with the navies and the Coast Guards of our uh, uh, region. So why do we do that? To generate trust. And how do we generate trust? We generate trust by, uh, by uh, working with them, uh, ensuring there is interoperability, uh, ensuring there is uh, uh, there is better domain awareness. Uh, uh, we we train them. We build the capacity. So all this leads to you know uh, 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 trust amongst the the countries in our region, the friendly foreign countries in our region. So that is a contribution from the navy side, which uh, also is uh, supported by the nation and the other you know effort by the other arms of the government. Uh, the uh, second i would say is uh, is becoming economically strong and uh, what i talked of you know being a, a, a trade or a port led economy we need to uh, we need to become uh, uh, to capitalize on the effort that is being put in uh, through gati shakti and you know the sagar mala and all these schemes a lot of work is happening so this uh, needs to be harnessed to its uh, full extent so that uh, you know we we move up in uh, in the uh, export and uh, import of trade in the in the region and third of course we should have uh, uh, the capability that is uh, uh, desirable uh, in maintaining uh, maritime security in the region which uh, requires you know greater networking 
greater uh, interoperability and greater uh, linkages, uh, you know, uh, breaking the silos within the multitude of agencies which are there in the maritime field. Uh, much effort has been done in this direction. I would say because at the uh, National uh, Security Council, uh, NSCS, now we have a National Maritime Security Coordinator uh, which has been created by the current government and uh, uh, we are seeing already a lot of uh, uh, changes being brought in. Uh, the coastal states and the four uh, union territories are also now very closely uh, involved in all the activities that are being pursued. And we are trying to bring in greater uh, uh, transparency, the maritime domain awareness uh, 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 project, the NMDA project has been sanctioned by the government recently. So uh, hopefully we will be able to uh, bring in greater, uh, greater uh, transparency, uh, at least to a much greater extent in the maritime domain. Uh, which will uh, help us uh, substantially towards uh, improving the maritime security. Thank you. Yes, please. I'll come to you. I'll come to you. Yes, yes. Um, good evening, sir. My name is Arindam Muswami, and I'm a postgraduate student from AIIS, NOIDA. So, um, as I've always believed that the strategies of a nation have always aligned with the security challenges and the opportunities. And with that, I would like to bring uh, in light of our neighbor, who has always created challenges. So uh, understanding that in the Indo-Pacific, China has always put a pressure or an influence in the small island developing states. And this has created several issues for India. So understanding the fact that the Chinese strategies, strategies have been going strong, what does it mean for India in the maritime domain to counteract the same? And uh, so understanding that, sir, um, in your speech you have mentioned that we have to be prepared for the future, uh, for the future challenges, sir. As we know that there has been a recent discovery that uh, uh, the continent Africa is splitting into two parts and this has been uh, re uh, published uh, in a peer journal. So, so uh, knowing that it would take a long time but it would create certain uh, opportunities and challenges for India knowing that the Indian diaspora is very strong in the eastern side. So, so uh, what would it mean? Uh, so we would like to have your comments in such a scenario. See, uh, uh, the, uh, as I said, the oceans are a global common. So much as we use the oceans, I think any other country can also, you know, use the oceans for their own growth and development. But we want it to be free, open, inclusive and uh, on, based on a rules-based order. If someone tries to upset the rules-based order, then there is a problem for everyone. So that has been our stance and that is what, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the Indian Navy works for and therefore we collaborate with like-minded nations, navies, to uh, ensure that the seas are, uh, you know, uh, are free, open and remain as a global commons. The, uh, the issue of, uh, of uh, influencing some of the uh, islands, uh, island countries, uh, this has uh, been well published and people are aware of it, many countries are aware of it, many, many of our neighbours have, uh, you know, fallen prey to this uh, uh, debt-laden uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, crisis. Uh, uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is being pursued by, you know, uh, some, uh, some countries. And we have been assisting uh, our friendly countries in the IOR. Uh, uh, financially as well as materially, we have been supporting their, uh, the maritime uh, forces in terms of capacity building, in, com in terms of uh, training, in terms of capability, in terms of exercises and so on. So that is one part we have been doing. It. The other greater challenge that we see in which, which may emerge is the one due to climate change and the rise of sea level. This may result in climate refugees or climate displaced persons. A, it may be internal to a country or it may be completely external. You know, it may happen to some of the countries in the region. In which case, we see there is a, is a challenge, there will be a challenge of uh, migration, there will be a challenge of, you know, um, of a national disaster, a natural disaster, how that needs to be addressed. There was a uh, study done by the National Maritime uh, Foundation, our National Maritime Foundation, which brought out that 
maybe by 2070 uh you know this uh, rise in sea level may take Bom- mumbai back to about 200 years earlier when she was seven islands so you know that is the type of uh, effects that rising sea level can have and uh, therefore what will be the challenges therefore uh, the need for a uh, disaster resilient uh, infrastructure and so on so uh, these are issues on which uh, you know we are seized off Uh, in fact a study by the us navy all uh, in 2019 also said that a large percentage of the bases will get flooded uh, by 2050 uh, due to uh, climate change and uh, rise of sea level okay yeah okay please sir i am arun agrawal an engineer who reads little bit uh, sir my question is if a rogue state like pakistan i am naming the name if when it come when push comes to show will be using non state uh, actors as they call it so in that case it is your job basically to prevent india so what is uh, the method of doing it uh, we uh, we are aware that uh, you know they are they harbor terrorists they they use them for uh, uh, progressing their agenda we saw 2611 as a outcome of that and many of the uh, uh, of the changes that were brought in into the uh, maritime domain as far as the uh, security aspects are concerned were triggered uh, uh, you know uh, or accelerated with uh, with that incident and uh, now uh, there is there is great focus to ensure that uh, you know uh, the there is greater awareness in the uh, in the domain and as i said the domain is quite challenging because we have uh, you know uh, close to 4 lakh uh, uh, fishing vessels which operate in our waters then over and above that the large number of over 1 lakh ships operate in the indian ocean region so uh, and they are constantly moving so the question of uh, detection uh, identification and then uh, seeing what they are doing is the challenge so we try to uh, maintain uh, uh, robust surveillance i would not if you ask me is it adequate uh, i i won't say it is it is uh, uh, optimal we need to uh, constantly improve on it we need to with the but with the assets that are available we try to optimize and uh, you know devise strategies so uh, uh, if uh, someone asks you know do you need more Uh, if you ask any commander he'll always see that he needs more because uh, you try to imagine what is the you know the most challenging uh, situation the most challenging enemy and uh, therefore you know you'll keep asking for more and more resources etc but that is not the way we need to see what, how best you can do your job with the resources that are available in an optimal manner so that is what we are uh, trying to do Uh, one of the challenges that uh, we face uh, uh, is of uh, drug running especially and uh, that the drugs originate from uh, afghanistan then uh, it comes through pakistan to the makran coast then it gets transshipped from small boats into uh, larger dhows there and then it comes all the way down to somewhere near the equator at the junction between uh, the maldives seychelles and uh, sri lanka it then from there it gets uh, transship to the uh, the destinations and uh, it goes to any of these three countries or some of it finds its way to uh, finds its way to india as well so in the last year we had uh, uh, almost 8000 crores worth of uh, of drugs being caught just by the indian navy alone and uh, what we do is we intercept them and we generally try and destroy it there itself the the trucks and we give them food and water and fuel to get back wherever they have come from so that is uh, you know we try to make it uh, expensive and uh, for them and not uh, a productive venture or not a, uh, a gainful uh, business so uh, we hope to uh, keep intercepting them but the challenge i would say is uh, you know just to just to tell you because uh, at sea if you have to uh, you know you may come across in a, in the horizon you may come across maybe six boats okay 
So if you have to stop one and just board it, it will take you about four hours. That is to board, to search and go through every corner of that board because they have become very ingenious in uh, trying to hide it, you know, inside the hull, inside in different places and so on. So it takes a long time and effort to check that vessel thoroughly. So uh, it is a time consuming uh, uh, aspect and therefore what is key is that you should have good intelligence as to if you know which is the vessel involved then it is much much easier and much more surer. So therefore we, uh, we work closely with the national intelligence agencies also to try and get it. So wherever the inputs are correct then we are more successful in trying to stop them. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think uh, I see about a dozen hands uh, already there. Sir, I'm okay. So I don't know how much time do you have. No, I'm okay. Sir. Okay, what we'll do is we'll take two or three questions together and then I'll come yeah. to you. So, and please uh, be brief. Yes. <coughs> sir, I am, I am R.D. Gupta former additional DG CPWD, a civil engineer from University of Turkey in 1967 batch. So my first question is that the, at global level, Indian Navy is sixth largest. But at the same time, when I was reading, it has been stated that in 20, 2023, its rank is fourth among the available navies in the world. So, would you kindly clarify as to why there is a difference of fourth and sixth? Okay. Number two is very small question. Uh, whether in the present day scenario, when nation is moving at very fast pace for progress and prosperity, Navy is getting adequate funds to meet its critical requirements. These are my two small Thank questions. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. I am Joshi from CAPS, focusing on maritime issues. Uh, I remember when Indian Navy organized the first IONS, the message was that we are not focusing on any leadership role in, in, in the Indian Ocean. And uh, Admiral Arun Prakash has written extensively about the same aspect because Navy cannot spare any uh, capabilities for taking leadership role. But the current political leadership, e the EM, PM, EAM, are arguing that India is not seeking talking about the leadership role, global leadership role. So is there thinking in the Indian Navy that uh, Indian Navy has to be the leader in the Indian Ocean or any kind of thinking about the leadership role in the Indian Ocean, especially in the context of what is going on in the Western Pacific? Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Yes, Shindy. So there's a camera behind me, so I can't get up. So the Chinese port, the, the Chinese are building this port, this base in Pekua, it's almost complete. And it's too large for the two submarines they have. Now, it's going to be ready in less than a year, is what we are hearing. Is that going to be a challenge for you? Because it will be right next to India. Besides that, have you been tracking uh, the PLA Navy submarines in the IOR recently. Thank you. Okay, so uh, firstly, the, I would answer that, uh, uh, you know, saying whether a Navy is, say, sixth largest or fourth largest, you know, these are uh, basically uh, different yardsticks, different organizations apply, you know, either in terms of capability, some apply in terms of numbers, some apply in terms of tonnage. So, if you look in different ways, then you will arrive at different numbers. But roughly, we are around between the fourth and the sixth, somewhere around that. So, that is what I would say. If you ask me about uh, the, uh, the budget, are we getting adequate? I think we are getting a reasonable share of the budget. Uh, and we are aware that we are an aspirational nation. There are conflicting requirements for, you know, for, uh, for social, for welfare activities and, you know, development activities and so on. And we are conscious of that. And uh, as a Navy, we know that if a country grows and our economy grows, definitely our budget will also grow because that is the way it is always, uh, you know, linked. 
and uh, if we become the third largest or the second largest economy at some point then obviously our share of the budget will will automatically go up and therefore we'll be able to afford more capability and and uh, you know in growth of the uh, organization now uh, uh, asking about uh, you know the leadership role i mean i think it is a it's a national uh, uh, na national policy of you know uh, uh, of the five S's where I've said that we need to, uh, uh, you know, deal with each other with respect and have uh, uh, sort of, you know, equal, uh, uh, have everybody sit around the table uh, in a uh, equal manner uh, because uh, uh, we are conscious of the fact that uh, in the region we need to support all of them. Uh, we look at them as friends and uh, we engo engage in cooperation with them. We, we treat them with, uh, you know, uh, uh, with uh, Saman and uh, therefore uh, it is, uh, it's important that uh, we develop the bonds, bonds of friendship and cooperation with them. So as a Navy also, we follow that and uh, it is very clearly articulated by our Honorable Prime Minister in uh, Saga and you know security and growth for all in the region so it is not about leadership but it is about participative you know and uh, collaboration so all of us need to participate in it all of us need to contribute and there is a saying that a rising tide you know lifts all boats uh, so uh, so that is the way we look at it uh, navies and coast guards that interact with us but there is something which we don't have which is there with them either in terms of expertise or knowledge of the local, uh, you know, uh, geography, or some practices that are more uh, applicable in those regions. So, uh, so therefore, you know, it's a collaborative effort, and as I said, you know, the collective maritime competence is what we try to achieve at sea. And uh, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, uh, the Chinese presence in the Indian Ocean region, uh, yes, indeed, uh, they have been there since 2008. Uh, they have had the anti-piracy escort force uh, since then. Uh, there have always been at least three ships, three warships. And uh, today, I would say we have, you know, anything between uh, uh, six to uh, ten uh, Chinese ships, be it uh, warships, be it uh, Chinese research vessels, uh, and whole lot of uh, fishing boats which operate in the Indian Ocean region. So, uh, uh, whenever we, uh, we detect or get uh, information of the, uh, of the Chinese presence or Chinese vessel entering the Iowa, we do keep uh, uh, track of them. We, uh, we keep track as to, you know, what are their uh, intentions. Uh, we keep them under surveillance. So, uh, our strategy is constantly uh, evolving. Uh, depending upon the the presence, the intent, and you know whatever is uh, uh, is being pursued by the uh, Chinese Navy. So yeah, we are we are aware of it, and uh, we are uh, monitoring the. Uh, okay. I think I uh, we are. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Please. I'm R.K. Dhawan from the University of Delhi. Uh, my very precise question is that, you know, like uh, for uh, naval, uh, to meet uh, naval challenges, regional unity is very important. And uh, India is uh, one of the very important countries of Asia Pacific. So I would like to know that, uh, whether we have uh, any uh, solid, we are part of any solidarity group, or do we have any bilateral agreement to fight together with friendly countries like Singapore or Australia or any such move that we have done or we are likely to do? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll answer your question first. In the sense, we are part of various uh, various initiatives. I would say, uh, like IONS, for example. Uh, you know, we are the founding member of Indian Ocean Naval Symposium. We are an uh, observer in uh, WPNS, Western Pacific Naval Symposium. Now, these are all, and, uh, you know, these are all, uh, you know, constructs where the navies participate 
we discuss you know we uh, so that you know we we the dialogue is very important so we we speak we speak we discuss issues uh, the what is the ultimate aim of a of a navy or armed force i would say uh, it is to deter conflict because the conflict doesn't you know serve anyone's purpose so uh, our, the first uh, and foremost uh, desire is to ensure that you know the you know we we uh, ensure peace in the area by deterring uh, uh, misadventure in in our water so that is that is the i would say the fundamental uh, aspect that we should look at and then if you are you know forced into uh, a conflict then of course we have to fight and win so therefore uh, uh, we uh, uh, we def that is how we engage with the countries in our neighborhood and i talked of the goa maritime conclave and various other small small uh, uh, the uh, colombo security conclave and uh, uh, we are part of a whole lot of uh, regional initiatives we we strongly feel that uh, there has to be regional solutions to regional problems and because we are we are here and we are the largest uh, resident naval power in the region so therefore uh, we have to uh, you know engage with uh, all of our you know like minded friendly countries and you know work together to maintain peace and and uh, by engaging with them uh, by exchanging information by ensuring maritime domain awareness we ensure that various illegal activities uh, you know which are below the level of conflict get addressed and when you keep the region relatively safe then uh, and you engage with them then the prospects of you know maintaining you know stability and peace uh, and uh, rather than it escalating into a conflict yeah so uh, you had talked of uh, uh, alliances i don't think india uh, uh, is ever thinking of uh, getting into alliances that's a political question uh, the navies don't engage in alliances we uh, we engage with other navies in exercises in multilateral exercises in bilateral exercises in various constructs uh, these are professional uh, engagements so we work together to ensure that you know there is uh, understanding interoperability trust all those things so that we generate uh, the confidence in each other and the ability to uh, to respond to some of these you know challenges as and when they arise okay Uh, sorry uh, your question i missed out yeah the 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 uh, the, the chinese uh, yeah the, the, see the you know the chinese the uh, china like all other uh, any other nation has got uh, the the right to use the seas for its uh, you know peaceful requirements and prosperity so they have uh, uh, various trading arrangements uh, with uh, countries in the ior uh, of course they have uh, they have their first uh, base overseas base at djibouti where they have uh, their assets deployed uh, so we uh, as a resident naval power in the indian ocean region we keep uh, monitoring the activities here not just by china but by all, all the other multinational forces that operate in the region so our aim is to ensure that uh, the uh, peace and stability doesn't get uh, upset uh, so uh, our strategy is to ensure that uh, we observe them we keep track of them and uh, this also provides inputs into our force planning and uh, capability development uh, uh, structure uh, uh, plans for the future so uh, we have uh, uh, that is why we have closer engagements with other countries in the region like sri lanka maldives seychelles uh, mozambique uh, you know reunion mauritius myanmar so we also have you know engagements in indonesia we have uh, we do engage regularly and interact with all of them participate in exercises and build strong friendships we have we do the uh, patrolling of our uh, you know the exclusive economic zone we do coordinated patrols so there is a lot of engagement that we do to uh, ensure that you know the area remains peaceful and secure so thank you very much sir for uh, you've been at it about one and a half hours and patiently answered all the questions in uh, great uh, depth and detail uh some uh, weeks ago admiral soni was giving us a talk on the maritime issues 
and he started by saying that India has been sea blind. Absolutely. And uh, you have, uh, you started your talk by saying that there is a growing awareness about maritime issues and I think a uh, number of examples you have given. And this uh, framework that you gave, the value framework is uh, a very powerful uh, framework for us to understand how the Navy is. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti.